flight. It's something that's uh, certainly inspired me uh, probably since I was very small. And uh, one of the, I suppose, reasons for that was I, I've got many happy memories with my late father flying these little model gliders. That must have left more of an impression on me than at the time I probably realized. So I hatched this idea 16 years into a sensible career as an oil trader. I hatched this idea that, um, well, I like a challenge. And why not think about flight? Uh, human flight and think about reimagining it where you could use your brain and your, uh, your body rather than a flight vehicle. So we're very good at designing helicopters and airplanes and sitting inside them. And then there's a lot of machinery around you which does quite a lot of the work. But just, just for no particular reason other than the joy of the challenge, what would happen if you used your brain uh, for the balance and control and you use your body uh, as the mechanism of actually supporting yourself? And this is an example of the kind of thing I used to get into I never quite could do exactly that. I mean, otherwise, it would be a picture of me. But, uh, <laughs> um, but I used to train with this guy in London uh, when uh, I used to be an oil trader, and, and it, was great. it was a great distraction, frankly, in getting out of the office. But it was a really good example, and, and the time I spent in the Royal Marines Reserve as well and doing ultramarathons and stuff, they were all really good examples of just how amazing human minds and bodies can be when you go and focus them on a challenge. So I thought, well, okay, flight. Let's, let's just see how you know, far we can take this. I'm not mad enough to think that I can flap my way to my objective, and so I, I realized that you need some horsepower. We, we are just not adequate in that manner. So, in 2016, I started experimenting and playing with uh, these little beasts. That, that is a micro -ga uh, gas turbine, a little baby jet engine, uh, which is putting out about 22 kilos of thrust, about 50 pounds of thrust, and only weighs about two kilos, so about four pounds. Uh, that was quite a big moment because actually it taught me a whole load of things, m namely that the assumptions around it ripping your arm off and talking your arm off and generally just setting fire to everything in the vicinity, that was all rubbish. And it was a really good example of actually just not entirely believing conventional wisdom and in, in as safe a way as possible, uh, hopefully you'd agree it's safe, I've got the fuel in a container in the mop bucket. Um, <laughs> and I did check if there's any traffic coming. Um, that, that was quite profound. It was just like a big fire hose of water. So there's obviously only one thing you can do, having gone and done that. So I've now got two. And you get some idea of the power when I try and push them out to the side. When you're actually leaning on them, it was okay. But that's now you know, over 100 pounds of thrust. It's really quite hard to stand upright. So in the theme of what you're going to see uh, over the next few minutes, um, you guess where we went next. Now, I'm now... now Sporting quite a bit of power here, and that was really quite, you know, really quite manageable. So, in the spirit of exploration, carried on trying over 2016 all sorts of different arrangements of these engines, some more successful than others. The, the cameraman didn't do a great job here. I think he prioritised his own safety rather than. Yeah, there you go. Really didn't work. So technically speaking, apart from it being very difficult to balance your arms and legs all in one go, there's now a tether to, to you know, comprehend, but you can't see it. So that didn't really work. So we just ditched the tether and I just got used to falling over. Uh, this was a silly idea. This was now a lot of engines and uh, it was way too unwieldy and way too unstable. So we didn't do that. Uh, then there was a, another model here where um, I'm doing the similar thing with the tether, but without the tether. Probably knock the sound down a tiny bit. It's certainly loud enough for me, I think. Um, so I'm trying to learn here, trying to learn the balance and control, but we realize this funny thing where when you feel something pushing on your feet and yet you're not touching the ground, there's this inclination to bend your knees. And you see, I think I do it uh, in a second here. Uh, you see, I'm sort of making reasonable progress, starting to learn, and then it all goes a bit wrong. Oh, there we go, see? But I was very happy because I hadn't, I, hadn't, I hadn't fallen over. Now, the, the model of having two on each arm and one on each leg ludicrously was starting to get there. It was just a question of me trying to learn how to control it. Um, and, uh, and I you know, made steady progress. This one's annoying, and then guess what happens? Bit my leg again. Uh, anyway, in, but about November 2016, again, in evenings and weekends and, and crazy times, I could drag mostly my family to this wet farmyard in Wiltshire in the UK. Um, I managed to do this. And uh, this is the pivotal moment when the idea actually turned into something that completely infeasibly actually worked. That was the first six second flight of, uh, thank you. <clears throat> we, we, so we, we, to cut a long story short, we launched this as a company in 2017, about April, and this is a little showreel of some of the ludicrous things we've been up to uh, in the intervening two years. Uh, you can turn it back up again. Um, yeah, we go. Uh, so. 
this, not that much. <laughs> I need the volume, I need a sort of volume one of these. Um, this event, so Bermuda as an event, is uh, number 89, 89 in 29 countries we've flown this because unusually a jet suit, who knew, fit in, fits into two check-in suitcases. So you can go anywhere in the world with a jet suit. All you need is some kind person to find you some diesel if you want, or jet fuel, they're pretty much the same thing, it runs fine on diesel, and then you show up and do this. Uh, interestingly, the civil aviation rules uh, in nearly every country we've been in, well, in fact, every country we've been in, or I'd probably be in prison, turn out to not cover jet suits. So, um, and so quite lucky discovery, really. So there's an example of all the crazy places we've been in, the accidental raise of over half a million dollars in a car park, but that's, I haven't got time to cover that story. Uh, we actually, I'm proud that it's a money-making business, so we actually put all the money back into R&D, but it's not like we're just burning through some crazy VC promise or anything. Uh, we do flight training for Canada as well. Uh, this is um, a guy after one day. The tether, this is what Matthew did. Um, this is after one day um, on that tether, so it's great. You can just genuinely relax. You're not going to fall over and, you know, eventually we give you enough power to hit your head on the ceiling, but only we don't give you enough power until you're demonstrating some degree of skill to not do that. Uh, and that's the last suit. We did actually sell one uh, for, we've sold a couple actually. Uh, that was the, one of the last ones we sold for about nearly half a million dollars. We don't really like selling them because, I don't know, people might start doing silly things with them. Uh, talking of silly things, this is one of the recent things I did with the Royal Navy in the UK. Here we go. Um, so it's a, it's a nice demonstration of the ridiculous degree of control and stability. And I've got about seven pilots in my team now. And I reckon probably half of them, with only a cumulative two hours of flight time, uh, could do the same. Again, we, in the time we have, I, you have to catch me after this to go through it and uh, try and justify this. You know, I, I can't really ski. I'm terrible on a skateboard. I've got no ability like that. And yet this, I could, I could read a bedtime story to my kids while I'm doing this. This is as intuitive as riding a bike. And it's all credit to the way the human brain can just adapt to a roughly similar balance regime that you experience every day when you're walking around. So that boat's moving. It's trying to actually lose me, and I just didn't notice. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of crazy, isn't it? So I should have slotted in a picture from the school yesterday, but I didn't quite manage to do that. So it's awesome landing at a school, literally landing at a school. Uh, I've got an 11-year-old and a 12-year-old, and if there's one surefire way of getting them to stop looking at an iPad or an iPhone, it's to land a 1,000-horsepower jet suit at their school. Uh, so it's very important to us to try and you know, help uh, you know, inspire another generation of kids, especially to kind of, uh, in the most politest possible way at a school, uh, question and challenge the textbook, because that, you know, that's turned out to be what we've really done and uh, shows what happens sometimes. So um, uh, the, 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 the kind of momentum of all this, aside from doing events around the world and training people, actually is about building a race series. And this is a little showreel of some of uh, kind of what we've been doing on that front. In fact, actually, I mean, this is what we'd be delighted to come back and do here sometime. We've got, as you can see, multiple pilots flying around. Thank you. We actually shot a, shot a four-pilot race promo thing for a supposed to be secret um, Hollywood uh, TV channel. We'll talk about crashing in a minute. Um, I sort of spoiled the crashing bit now. Um, uh, so you, know, you imagine the Rebel Air Race format, a load of pylons, you fly around, you do it over water, because then if you fall over, it becomes a bit of fun rather than actually some you know, injury-causing issue. Uh, but imagine going racing around a load of pylons in an inner city water area, of which nearly every city in the world has that. But I mean, I have to say, your water um, is a pretty spectacular place where you could do this. And it's a wonderful celebration of kind of human beings and technology. Um, so, you know, I, that, that's really our, our kind of near-term plan. As you can see from this footage, when you've got an FPV drone following you, it looks almost kind of unreal. Um, there's a little section in here which I had the privilege of presenting for the first time only last week to the Society of Experimental Test Pilots in LA, and they're all astronauts. Yes, over here. There you are. Um, and uh, fast jet test pilots. And, uh, you know, personally, from a technology point of view, this is the bit that really, uh, really excites me. So I'm just going to step you through some of this. So we can clearly fly at this stage, and this is only about a year ago, we can clearly fly very happily with the vectored flight control system, right? Which is just really blowing air the opposite direction to where you want to go. But what about if you could transition to actually generating lift with wings? It's vastly more effective and efficient than actually blowing air downwards. The, the analogy would be the Harrier or the F-35 or the Osprey aircraft, for instance, um, or um, even a helicopter. A helicopter in a hover is not very efficient, but as soon as it's traveling forwards, 
and, it generating, and it's generating lift, it's much more efficient. So in the spirit of, of hacking stuff together, that is about the most basic thing that barely qualifies as a wing. It's a piece of plywood strapped to my back. <laughs> and uh, it's just, as you saw, I talked over the bit with the leg wing. You saw they didn't work at all. Uh, and this, this was just uh, you know, the, the first kind of round of experimentation. This is a nice little demonstration here of how, despite having that on, and it wasn't windy, you can see I could just happily maneuver around like normal. So anyway, that was so kind of potentially positive that we then went to the next stage, which was to mess around with, frankly, very large model aircraft wings, because they were very accessible, and they're actually very strong, and it was something we could go and play with. And this little clip here shows a bunch of little tests we did and it does turn out to be quite nice flying over long grass because you can really visualize the thrust. But uh, and so th th this is a compilation of a few bits and pieces. That if you sharp-eyed ones of you, of you will notice that the angles of attack and the, the um, dihedral and everything of these tests were all varied um, uh, across this. The reason I left this little clip in is because for the first time ever, if you look at the flags blowing around, I actually had to do an, a go-around. I tried to land back in the farmyard, but I was being buffeted so much by the wind I actually had to do a loop back round, so it was an interesting moment in my mind to think, oh, that's never happened before. Uh, we uh, didn't, again, lose the appetite for... That wasn't me, actually. That was one of my, uh, one of my volunteers. It does look like we've kind of strapped him to that, but um, this was the kind of testing we were not ashamed to do. You know, uh, our, our ethos is you quickly analyse what the worst is that can happen and if it's survivable. I think it's survivable. I mean, we might run him over, maybe, but then we just get on and do it. Now, um, where we ended up going was actually um, inspired by w uh, a wingsuit structure. So it's a leg wing uh, with also, we, we messed around with kind of minor arm webbing as well. This worked really well. This is the first test we did of this in, uh, gosh, it must have been about six, seven months ago, something like that. And you can see all I do is just kind of open my legs. There's two little pockets. They scoop the air up as I go through, uh, as, I, as I go fast, and then they expand out. The angle here is not great, but I really didn't want to push the speed because it would be potentially dangerous falling at you know decent speed on grass. We tend to do all the crazy stuff over water. Anyway, I'm going to zip through that one. This is an example of all of the parallel developments we carried on conducting with um, a fixed upper body wing. But what we learned was that unless you've got some degree of aerodynamic control, it's just not very fun putting a wing on your back. And that's a really silly one there we tried. Um, because actually you're just a passenger to wherever the wind's going to blow you. There's no aerodynamic surfaces. There's no ailerons or elevators or rudder or anything on there. So we really much, very much focused on the leg wing and a very slim down uh, upper body wing. And then this, this clip, I, I've thrown this in here because well, it was quite fun really. The BBC approached us to, to fly, fly to the Isle of Wight. So we thought, you know, it's a good, as good as opportunity as any to test a wing. I'd never flown with the wing on my back at this stage. so. The number of times I've been in the air, you know, around now, thinking, oh, it doesn't really work as well as I was hoping, and then having to kind of live adapt to, to the different characteristics. You can see my feet kind of wobbling around a fair amount uh, as this clip goes on. You can see them sort of wobbling around. Th this was what was going through my head at the time as I was flying across, you can see, to the, uh, the other side of the water. I need some greater degree of directional stability. I'm like a sort of bathroom tile going through the air. Those little those little, little winglets were trying to keep me going straight, but they really didn't work very well. So um, what we ended up realizing was that a bit like an arrow, I'm going to need some feathers on the end of the arrow to keep some degree of directional stability. And so that's where we went to. So I'm going to speed that on. You get the idea. Anyway, I do land. I clearly don't die because I'm here. Um, <laughs> so uh, this is where we went to with the next iteration. You notice these little panels on my legs. They are like the feathers on the back of an arrow. And actually, the, the change was miraculous. I suddenly felt like I wasn't constantly in what I think you technically would call your instability, as in doing that motion, which at 60 miles an hour is quite scary. So it became so stable that um, this is a little compilation of uh, some of the testing we were doing over a lake. And it's where we've set our own internal kind of speed record. I'm doing the Guinness World Record Day thing again in November. So we should beat the 32 miles an hour that's currently the record that we set. Uh, if you notice the little speedometer in a second, if it's the one I remember, you can see for yourself how fast I'm now traveling. Fairly, fairly low, really not that high above the uh, water. You can see my shadow there. That's how stable it is. You wouldn't be able to do that kind of speed if it wasn't pretty rock solid. Now, we haven't lost the appetite for learning uh, from failure as long as that failure is recoverable. I mean, you know, nothing's perfect in life. I used to cycle commute across London for 16 years. That was arguably more dangerous. Um, 
This is an example joyously filmed by my wife who turned up at the same lake at the very last test we did when I decided it would be a good idea to try at speed to create some violent motion with my legs to see what effect that would have on my flight attitude. The idea being I would come out of the aerodynamic mode into VTOL again and then with the power back up again come in for a nice landing. Something I'd been doing all day until she turned up and I did this. Um, I climbed something crazy. While that was going on, I thought, okay, that's fine. Now I've got rid of that. And I forgot to nudge the power up on the, uh, on the, on the suit. And you can see how so close. I mean, I, my priority was not go in the water. And then the second priority was to not hit the fence. And the third one was not to hit my wife. So <laughs> in that order, you have to quickly prioritize. <laughs> now, um, what, what, I, what I usually, uh, I, I'll blow the surprise. Um, what I usually finish off with is um, uh, you know, one of the latest clips we've got in terms of pushing boundaries and speed and whatever. But I, I, th I firmly believe in this whole ethos of actually not being afraid to put yourself out there, go down a pathway that's probably marked either impossible, possibly stupid, possibly dangerous. As long as you permanently, as long as you comprehensively assess, like I said, what is the worst that can happen? And if you can get back up again, financially, reputationally, and from a safety point of view, then go and do it. And in that spirit, I'm gonna go and show you the journey we've been on. So I, could, I can narrate some of these. Nearly all of them so far have been fuel. That's where I just basically went. I can't run at 20 miles an hour, and I just was still doing that. And uh, yeah, that was silly. This guy, nothing wrong with that. He just got scared of the flag. That was a compressor stall for any engineers in the room, with me hovering in the background watching. That was an engine failure. I knew it was happening, but the beach was so busy. Uh, it was the Bournemouth Air Show, I just had to kind of ditch. Similar version with this guy. Here we go. Look at that one. That was a big one. We have a, a positive buoyancy in the suit and a life jacket that's triggered automatically, so there he's merrily waving at me. This is in the Maldives. They contaminated my fuel with fabric conditioner, which was great. Um, this guy, <laughs> this guy uh, just turned. As you turn, you need to crank the power up and he does exactly the same thing, this time in Belgrade. He should have cranked the power up as he turned. You're asking the thrust to lift you and turn you, and uh, this, is when the, this is the four pilot race. He got the gate wrong and went in, and then his colleague, just behind him, here we go, decides to go in head first. Uh, he just jumps too early. <laughs> Physics, it's a bummer. <laughs> and then the one that everybody seems to like the most is me. <laughs> You see, now I could end the whole presentation on, on that, right? Uh, but I haven't. So thanks to John Singleton and his friends, yesterday we had a bit of fun and we found some weather, which seems very unlike the weather you have today. And we shot what we've hastily thrown together as a little edit here. And this hasn't been shown anywhere yet. Um, but uh, thank you to Bermuda and all of you for making this possible because it was a huge amount of fun and we'd be privileged to come back at some point with more than just me flying in the form of a race series. So uh, enjoy this. If you can turn up the sound a little bit. Here we go. <laughs> Hopefully. Thank you very much. So there's a lot more on Instagram there if you want to watch that. Thank you.